Alan Wake 2 is a psychological survival horror game, and the player takes on the role of two different hero characters. The title of character, Alan Wake. The story is a monster and a new character, Saga Anderson. I'm glad you're on this case with me, Anderson. Alan Wake 2 has many tools in it. <gasps> two narratives. We are exploring two worlds. It's not just Alan Wake this time. We have this theme of duality and echoes in Alan Wake 2, so we needed a counterpoint, like another perspective in the game that was a playoff of Alan's, as well as having a character located in the Pacific Northwest so we could have both of those worlds present in the game and playable for the players. Even when we are not playing him, there are a lot of things that tie the story to him, and there are other ways how he is present in those moments as well. The character of Saga, she's an FBI agent and relative newcomer to the Bright Falls area. She is a really capable investigator. She is a mom. She's a teller of bad puns. What's not to love? She's enthusiastic about her job. She really enjoys what she does. But I think her most defining quality for me is her kindness. She's a very empathetic person, and she brings that into her work, and it makes her a better detective and profiler. These two different professions that are similar but different. The artist is looking for inspiration, the detective is looking for answers. You can see the parallel there, but there's different approaches to those things. We're obviously quite aware that the first game came out 13 years ago. So we wanted to make sure that we had a hero character who would bring the perspective of new players. We wanted to make sure that new players into the experience would be learning with her through the story. We wanted to make absolutely sure that we find the right actor for the role. And we were looking for quite a while for Saga. Hi, I'm Melanie Liebird, and I'm playing Saga Anderson in Alan Wake 2. This is my first time working in this medium and doing a game. It's just nice to learn something new. The voiceover part of it can be very intense when you get in the booth, but I've learned so much. All of us have been working with Melanie, and because of the writing process being ongoing, there are always new ideas and writing it more and more specifically to her as a role. I'm excited for the world to see Saga because I think she's a brilliant role model. And just to see a woman in this role, a woman of colour being a protagonist in a game that we don't see that often, and just to have a lifestyle that she has, doing her best to balance work and a family, and I just think that's really relatable for a lot of people. While you know, we wanted to create one cohesive experience, we wanted to give each kind of playable character in their world its own style and mood. Something's not right! In a setup for Saga's experience, she's investigating these ritualistic serial killings. When we were looking at, like, from a narrative and tone perspective, looking at things like True Detective, we actually have a lot of, like, 90s references in terms of, like, things like Seven. The events that bring her to the Pacific Northwest are a series of murders, and they think there might be a serial killer somewhere lurking in the area. Part of this experience taking place in Pacific Northwest is centered around our fictional small town of Bright Falls. This idyllic, slightly quirky small town that clearly then under the surface has shadows and darker things waiting and a, and a mystery waiting. In the first game, you didn't really get to explore the environments, but now you will be able to walk around the streets, discover the town a bit more, and revisit existing locations, like the diner, for example. Quite a lot of research was done uh, to prepare for this project. I spent several weeks reading research papers, gathering data on forest surveys, learning about key species of the area to properly do justice to the Pacific Northwest. The photogrammetry side of it uh, means that we can actually scan trees on site ourselves. The trees that we're seeing in the game are literally the trees that are from this area in the Pacific Northwest. The player will be going back to Cauldron Lake, which is obviously a key part of the story, be exploring all the forests that are around there. And because we kind of are more slightly open area based, so the player can freely explore, the player can kind of go back and revisit locations as part of their playthrough. Saga Anderson, she's not just any FBI agent coming into this case. There are elements to this that, that very much tie to kind of who she really is and, and a journey, a, a mystery to be discovered there as well. First things first, what's your name? So 
So where has Alan Wake been these 13 years? He went missing at the end of the first game. That is the question. We knew from the beginning that, that when Wake ends up in the dark place, uh, getting out from there is going to be a long hellish journey uh, and a hard struggle. And I guess that, that where we are now is fiction becoming reality. I was playing a lot of fantasy games before I really had ever heard about Alan Wake and a friend recommended it. And it had a big impression on me just because of how complex the characters were. Seeing a game that rivaled other mediums with its complexity of character was really inspiring to me. Hello? The game that sort of nailed Remedy on their storytelling. I was mostly impressed by the atmosphere and the, the lighting and especially the, I think, the use of music. It was unlike anything I'd ever played and it felt like I was transported into this playable Stephen King novel with this weird story taking me for a crazy ride. It was first of all proving that we can do bigger games in Finland. There's this Finnish flavor in it that you, you cannot really put your finger on it, and I like it dearly. We are kind of like cherishing our, our, our you know, culture and what we are known for, our quirky little things and manners. Obviously, before Alan Wake, you had Max Payne, which was quirky and strange. But I would say Alan Wake kind of took those qualities and ramped them up to 11. And it's very rare to see a game that is equal parts horror, humor, and strangeness. Al, please tell me we're headed for the nearest. You're now leaving Bright Falls. Come back soon, sign. It was very, very important to me to come up with a hero character who is not a professional hero. Him being a writer allowed me to explore the idea of creative process and writing process as part of the plot, which keeps on being an element, of course, in, in Alan Wake 2 as well. I think it's kind of common knowledge that we took a lot of inspiration from Twin Peaks and there was nothing quite like that at the time. We tried to, in that game, integrate the story into the gameplay more, so with the manuscript pages the player found, kind of try and find novel ways to kind of tell the story. These projects are huge endeavors and many, many things, many of them out of, totally out of your control, need to click into place for a big game to happen. There is an element of luck. The same very cool concept at certain point in time might not get any interest or excitement around it. Suddenly, everybody wants it. Fuse box is missing a fuse. Horror as a genre in pop culture overall has been growing in popularity a lot. And I think that that was the missing puzzle bees in creating a concept of Alan Wake 2 where everything just suddenly clicked into place and was very exciting. In the build-up to the Game Awards, announcing Alan Wake 2 was huge for us. It was huge for the team because this is an idea that has lived in Sam's brain for 13 years. And now we finally get to present at least a sliver of it to the world. This is so exciting. Alan Wake 2, it's been a decade fans have been asking you for it. Why is now the right time to bring him back? We knew this is going to be a pretty scary experience. I was but gonna say now we are convinced everybody is ready. What? You are ready. We showcased a, a demo of the game when we were at the Summer Games Fest. We chose a mission which takes place on Saga's side and it showcases the Pacific Northwest. She's investigating, there's a lot of supernatural weirdness. For fans of the franchise, it's a return to Cauldron Lake, an old friend, and it's got Casey in it. <laughs> Remedy's really found its niche. We know our strengths, we know what we are good at. We know that that is world building, that is atmosphere, and we keep building on these strengths and we keep investing into all other areas and seeing how can we do more, how can we go bigger, how can we go bolder. It's a story that you're not told, it's a story that you play. And the team has done a lot of really great work in coming up with unique and interesting ways to make that experience playable. Between every game project, that we have made, we have done a new concept of Alan Wake 2. It's been frustrating through the years, 
not being able to get it started and be excited about it, and then it's not happening. I think that the game we are now making is by far the most exciting, the most interesting and ambitious one out of all of those concepts. And I'm really, really happy that it's this Alan Wake 2 that we are making and none of the earlier ones. The saga experience that takes place in the Pacific Northwest is only one part of this experience. The other side is us returning to play as Alan Wake and revisiting a location not only from his past, but also from Remedy's past. At the end of the first game, uh, Alan Wake dove into Cauldron Lake and ended up in the nightmare dimension underneath the lake or connected to the lake. There is a whole world there waiting and he's been stuck there ever since. It's a nightmare reality based on the person's subconscious. For Alan Wake himself, he's gone back to a place from his past. New York, this fictional version of New York, has a certain magic to it. It's this archetype of a big city. To me, that feels like the right place. He is a writer from New York City. A lot of his books were these gritty, noir, grimy version of New York City. And so we're starting to see this almost replica of his own internal image of New York start to build itself around him. There's a lot of history that's happened there from a narrative experience related to his wife, Alice. There will be characters that turn up in New York that kind of are connected to some of those books that he wrote as well. The New York we refer to is an echo of the hard-boiled crime noir city present in the Alex Casey book, which is the novel written by Alan Wake. Another place to use in this story. We only used the very old school graffiti from the 70s and the 80s, and we kind of came up with our own version of it, which has a bit of a twist of like horror and nightmare. So we created something that we call nightmare graffiti. If you pay attention to details, even the smallest sign has something to say to you. And we want to create the feeling that the, the dark place is talking to Alan and the player. It's sort of a surreal, ever-changing, ever-modulating dreamscape. We want to make the player feel uneasy at all times. He has learned a lot. So we come back to him and in some ways, he is the master of the supernatural now. Is he better off because of that? No, quite the contrary. And that to me also is a big part of the horror of it. Like he's really, really lost and really, really struggling. For him, it could be one or a thousand years. He is just in this room with a typewriter and that's his world at this point. He's just writing and writing and writing and working through a way out, like trying to find an escape through the only tool that he has, which is writing. Saga is fighting for her life while Alan is fighting for his own sanity. It's really about like paranoia, confusion. Will you take the risk of revealing the shadow even if there is a monster hidden behind? In the Pacific Northwest, playing a Saga, I feel there's more of an ebb and flow or at least it will feel that way to the player, they'd come back to Saga as a part of the game and feel maybe a little bit of relief. Not to say that the Pacific Northwest doesn't have its own dangers, because we definitely do. To me, Il Cavilli, the physical actor of Alan Wake, and Matthew Porreda, the, the, the voice actor of Alan Wake, that is who Alan Wake is. There was never any question of Alan Wake being portrayed by anyone else. This is how, how it works. Ilka will paint a picture, and then he'll send it to me, and then I'll, I'll paint, the, paint a little bit on the picture, and then I send it back to him. There's this kind of collaboration that we do, and it's very rare that you see us in the same place together. It's singular, and it's, it's ours. Did you write these pages, Mr. Wake? I'm trying to remember it. When we were making Alan Wake 1, we always used to say that he's terrified but cool. I don't think that a lot of the coolness is, is left. He's in deep trouble. There's no escape. You will never escape. You will drown here. You are stuck in a loop. You don't have a clue. You are lost. There's a humanity to him that you're going to see in this game that you didn't get in the first game. There's a depth. Welcome, welcome. We have a great show for you here tonight. 
Hi, my name is David Harewood, and I'm playing a character called Walling Door in Alan Wake D. This is my talk show in between with Walling Door. Alan Wake is here. Alan Wake, one of my all time favorite writers and guests on the show. He seems fairly affable and friendly and fun. But as the story develops, I think you get an idea that Dor is not quite the person who he seems to be. As an actor and a gamer, it's just really cool to be not just in a video game, but to be in a video game made by who I think are probably some of the best video makers. Their storytelling is fantastic, and some of it's really dark. As a writer, you're always thinking, well, my stuff isn't good enough. Is this, you know, going to actually work? And I think Alan is getting that feedback in a much more tangible and consequential way. It's interesting taking your own profession and applying it as a threat to a character. <laughs> I, I know you from somewhere. You've just forgotten again. We're in it together. Don't worry. We have been working hard to make sure that Alan Wake 2 is a very satisfying continuation to Alan Wake's journey. It is not the story that you would expect, but in my opinion, it is the better for it, and you will be surprised, and I hope pleasantly. For me personally, one of the, the key components in creating these kind of atmospheric experiences is definitely sound. There's not like a rule book for a playbook for like, okay, this is how you how you make horror. Horror is, is more to do with the, the the subconscious, the drawing on fear, like really trying to manipulate the, the player into feeling something and feeling anticipation and dread. And that is one of the hardest things and one of the most exciting things that a, a sound designer could actually do. To be able to create those sort of tension moments, we have to focus quite a lot on how the player feels. Focus on Foley and breathing, for example, because Foley and breathing within that world will bring the player so much closer to the characters. FBI, show yourself! Before you hit those tensions, before you build up to these moments, then you have to get the player to feel like Alan or like Saga, and it's a lot of focus that goes into getting that correct. If you have ever experienced something that shocks you, it takes a little while to really understand what happened. That's called the nervous delay, or nerve delay, basically. If you delay that sound effect for just a little bit, it increases your own bodily effect, and it becomes much more powerful that way. We play the game a lot ourselves and go, okay, what are you feeling at these points? But we often are chasing something that we've seen somewhere else. Like pacing of the scenes is really important. Um, looking at like how TV shows are paced and how we build the narrative across time throughout the entire game. We had to use some extraordinary instruments, among them Marvin. It's interesting to play those instruments because they aren't equipped with a keyboard or despite the fact that you bow them, they don't reproduce anything that resembles even closely any string instrument or whatnot. They are just producing noise. We did a lot of recordings on instruments as well on the audio design side, so we were smashing them up, submerging them, bowing them. We sent these to Petri, Petri sends us his stem, so it's a very collaborative effort, and specifically in the dark place, because we want to blur the line between sound design and music. Hello. Hello, Wake. Music is part of the storytelling and an important component. When Petri Alanko was working on the soundtrack of the first game. It was a wonderful experience and collaboration. I feel that looking back to the soundtrack that went on to win multiple awards, it's a huge part of the feeling, emotion, and it captures the Pacific Northwest landscapes and the scary parts of the experience so well. 
remedies quite clearly in a league of their own when it comes to storytelling, characters and so forth. It's uh, important to me as a composer because they sort of give you the brain food for the themes, motifs and orchestration. I, I really, really wanted to keep on working with Petri. There was no question about him not returning to Alan Wake 2. It's been wonderful having him back working on the soundtrack for this game. Look in the mirror. The, the relationship that we've had with poets has been going on for a long time and it's been really cool to watch them grow and get more used to what we have to do. We've been collaborating with Poets of the Fall ever since Max Payne 2. And the big step forward in that was the idea of them assuming the role of an in-world fictional band of old gods of Asgard for Alan Wake. And songs that were custom made to comment on the plot and the lore of the world. When Sam came back to me and, and said that they're actually doing more Alan Wake and they wanted old gods to have an even sort of bigger role in it, and that was very exciting. I don't think there was ever a question in our minds about whether we would do it or not. It's always been so much fun to do that stuff, and it's challenging in its ways, but it's also um, educational from the get-go. It was like, yeah, let's do this. <laughs> we have absolutely stunning pieces of music that we are using to give you a further perspective into the story custom-made for Alan Wake 2. I wanted to be really ambitious with the storytelling in Alan Wake 2 and include music for the storytelling as well, with lyrics acting as an extension to the story. We have created a number of custom songs for the game and the fried music with Jukka Immonen and Teemu Prunila have been a key part of this. Fried Music is a music production company. It's formed a bit over 20 years ago. I mean, we work with all the majors, Sony, uh, Universal, Warner, and the producers and our partners. We work with, uh, with David Guetta, Flo Rida, internationally and um, at locally. Pretty much all the A-list artists here in Finland. The first talks we had like, probably like four or five years ago, that didn't happen straight away at that time, but you know, we, we've been in contact, we've been in talks, and the, now it came to happen, and uh, really happy to be a part of this, this project. We've been patiently waiting the right project and opportunity to do this. And because of the Scandinavian influence we have in the game, we were trying to find the right Scandinavian partners and artists to align with the vision and aesthetics of Alan Wake 2. We picked the artists and the writers pretty much upon so after we had the talks with Sam and Villa, basically interviewing them and knowing what they want. I showed the game, talked about the themes and the story around each song that we needed, and provided poetry that I had written as a starting point for the lyrics. What I really, really wanted that the song camp is a songmaker's paradise. The only rule that we had was the lyrics need to be about the story. You've been missing for 13 years. 13. Every single thing on those songs that we did is based on those poems and those visuals that we saw. So uh, I, I can't see any a tighter relationship of a song and a game. You know, at least we haven't done anything like this before. 
pause. Yeah, that's <laughs> careful. It's, the first pass is like perfect yeah. as yeah. it is. And we can use cool. stuff from the second round. So we, we like, gotta like, gather a bunch of people in a studio or a house or whatever, and then we form groups, and then they have like the briefs, like this is what we're looking for. And monsters wear many faces. <laughs> And we kind of had five, six artists to write for, for all the different characters of the game and like the different pivotal moments in the game. That's where we started this morning. Woo! Yeah! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very different vibe. <laughs> and I've played Remedy games since Death Rally, really, like all the way from like the first first game. So I didn't know what the song camp was for. They didn't like. They wanted to kind of keep it really hush hush. But when I saw Sam walking, like in the lobby, I I felt like starstruck. It was like that's Max Payne walking walking in the lobby, like, and oh shit, it's a Remedy camp. I knew right away that we're doing something for a new Remedy game. So we were supposed to uh, have more like decorations on the walls that will set the mood, but we didn't need that so much because like the mood was just like inspiring and crazy. It was really nice. There's something I'm forgetting. Uh, it was definitely something that I've never done before, like going to the studio with all the like Alan Wake scary pictures everywhere and being like, okay, let's get in the mood of darkness. Yeah, and with the, yeah, no, that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, um, you know the song but we didn't of, uh, have any like genre suggestions at all. We just went there to the studio and like, let's do something that is not too pop. And we're all like pop music makers. We have this like structures in our heads already and we had to kind of break everything and do something like completely different and that was very inspiring yeah it was like easy to make the songs because on my own dark dark vibes and stuff so it was really me the whole thing uh, my favorite one was i follow you into the dark because i actually felt like it could be my own song so if it, if it wouldn't go to the game i would i would have done it by myself <laughs> I'm really excited about the amount of art in, in different forms and mediums that we have inside Alan Wake 2. Music especially. I'm most proud about this project is not the fact that we have so many great songs in this game, but also how well these songs integrate into the story of Alan Wake 2. Now we have seven incredible songs elevating the whole game experience at the end of key episodes there are these highlights in all of these game projects really this whole thing working with these artists and having these songs really really crafted to be about the story i'm i'm sure that i will treasure the memory uh, of the whole experience forever so now I wait to obviously gameplay mechanics, kind of creating that survival horror experience is very important. There's going to be a lot to handle, but the player will have all the tools in their disposal to fight the darkness. Saga stories start relatively classic horror movie. It's like someone from the real world entering this quirky town coming here to do a job. She has this uncanny intuition that allow her to solve difficult case. She kind of perceives that threat through the lens of this case board. The case board is a mental projection where she kind of gets to stash data that she's gathered and that's where she makes sense of it. She's profiling suspects who appear in vision-like way. She calls it her mind place. When she's confronted to her first taking, suddenly the supernatural is really present and she's excited about it. She's curious, it's something new for her. 
When Kieran meets Saga for the first time, it was interesting to have this feeling of like being protective. Like, trust me, you don't want to cross this line because when you see all the things that we've seen at FBC, there's no coming back from this. But when the supernatural threaten a family, the stakes are much higher and she has to fight for her own life and the life of her loved one. Logan? Logan! So Saga has her mind place and then because we've got the two experiences, this idea of duality, we wanted to have the same concept mirrored on Alan Wake's side. So he has what we call the writer's room. They'll be in a version of Wake's cabin from the first game. And then inside there, we have different modules that the player can interact with. One of those modules is what we call the plot board. The player can see what they've done in the past. It almost acts like a quest log in a traditional game. And the player will be discovering inspiration for Alan. So he'll be kind of coming across what we call echo scenes. Something lingered here. I have forgotten memory, an echo. These give Alan ideas that uh, the player can then utilize on the board. It's the idea of rewriting reality to be able to change the world around them. I changed the story. And with that, the dark place changed. This allows them to kind of uh, progress through areas they would not be able to before. It'll uncover new narrative information, uh, potentially even uncover more dangerous threats in, in that space. Some fed came looking for the cult, but it was a trap. Why is definitely a big part of Alan Wake too. We have this new mechanic that allows Alan to place and remove lights in predefined scenes. And uh, since the dark place works in mysterious ways, doing this actually has a physical effect on the world. So, for example, a wall could turn into a doorway or a set of ladders. This gives, of course, different opportunities for exploration and gameplay. You need to use your light in a conservative way because sometimes it helps you to guide you away and sometimes it can actually hamper your progression. Saga needs to use her flashlight to burn away in the darkness, expose weak spot, and finding new possibilities of taking down the enemies. And for Wake, it's a matter of figuring out what is real and what is not. The danger will be lurking behind every single corner. You will never escape! Definitely, light is a weapon, but it's also a way to survive. From time to time, you might get overwhelmed. So you need to constantly push the threat back and seek refuge in the light and manage resources while doing all that. We have put a lot of emphasis on the physicality on the enemies, where they animate and how they hit the player. One thing that is important in comparison to other games that we have made, that player needs to very actively look at the enemy tells, look at their combos, time their dodges, time their attacks carefully to defeat the foe while preserving the ammo. We have weapon that allows more silenced approach, and then we have more close and personal, getting the job done <laughs> style of weaponry. Alan Wake 2 is built on the foundation of our previous games. It's not just a step forward. To me, personally, it, it feels like a leap forward. The elements in interactive storytelling that I have wanted to experiment on and, and brought to our games, they are all there present, all pushed way forward in all kinds of unexpected ways. It's all a very logical continuation on this journey. Alan Wake 2 is a horror game. In horror stories, we only have victims and monsters. We've come up with a new take on the dark presence, which is more dangerous and terrifying than ever. Show me that. Horror for me is something that connects my basic primal fears with reality. I love things like atmospheric horror, psychological horror, haunted houses. I like it because the genre of horror has the guts to look at the things that you are too scared to look at yourself. I think a good horror can stick with you for days, sometimes even years. And I think if a good horror manages to give you that feeling, they've really captured something elusive and almost intangible and traumatize the audience in a really, really good way. I don't want to be in the story, just write me out of the story. I really like writing it because I don't have to be 
surprised by it in a way. I'm setting up surprise for other people. I can scare them. I don't scare myself. I'm in control. <laughs> Alan Wake 1 was very much known for its narrative and it was telling a horror story. But then there was a bit of a dissonance between the story trying to have this slightly more slow burn feel to it and the kind of fast paced action gameplay. So we just felt that there was much more of a cohesive fit between the genre of survival horror and the kind of story we wanted to tell for the sequel. It's not so much about the body horror, it's the everyday weird. Things that look just perfectly fine and then a twist comes and you're like, okay, what's, what's going on here? Like using dark place as an example, every single shadow, a moving piece, I'm looking at it, okay, what was there? The flashlight only illuminates a certain part of the scene, so it very easily focuses your attention in a certain composition. Having the, the lighting and the shadows dance around the environment quickly incites your brain to play tricks on you. Essentially, what makes the environment scary is, is the atmosphere. So when you add the lighting and the music, that's when the fun begins. Horror tends to be quite a you know, personal perspective towards the issue itself. At times I've noticed that I felt uneased, even anxious. It's really interesting to bring yourself towards that edge musically. We've done a lot of sound design experimentation. For example, with the Dark Presence and Dark Presence Raw. What is that? How do we make that so evil? And we've listened to an enormous amount of different people screaming and animals trying to find the correct scream to fit the dark presence. I think we managed to make it feel like it's a place with a personality, with a pretty unique feel. We're trying to avoid a lot of the cliches, we're trying not to fall into those traps. So the, the sense of dread and anticipation is really there. Get away! Get away! The live action elements are part of the horror for sure. We are using blended video on top of the game footage for these very strange nightmarish visions. Alan Wake as a franchise is very much supernatural, very dreamlike. So it allows us to kind of lean on that and then utilize live action in a way that doesn't feel disconnected from that kind of overall experience. Using live action film footage in our games comes from several different directions. Our games are set in a version of present day. And there I feel that building the world using the mediums that are present in our lives is important and makes it more believable and is just a very logical choice. We are almost like shifting through layers of reality, so we are falling into these live action bits that you see on the screen and experiencing that and then falling out of them again. Doing more live action is very, very exciting for me. Yeah. I love doing motion capture and all that, but being with you in I the know. same room, it's I mean, being, set, yeah, okay. it, it's fantastic. Each shot and each scene is like different, it's like a different story and it, it's been great. I've never done anything like this. It's been cool. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. You always have an idea of what the game will be when you start out. And then more creative people who are better at your job than you are come on and do cool stuff. This idea I had is kind of not exactly as it was when we started out, but it's become this thing which is even better than what I thought it was going to be. I feel lucky that, that I have been able to stuff all kinds of crazy experimental things into this experience. Atmosphere and horror and interactive storytelling and mixing of different mediums together, all of that combined into what Alan Wake 2 is. Fans of the original game and people who may have not experienced Alan Wake, be afraid, be very afraid. Previously on Alan Wake. Cauldron Lake is a special place. Alice? Alice? My name is Alan Wake, and I'm a writer. Alan Wake? Oh, God! I am your biggest fan! I came to Bright Falls with my wife, Alice. I was a successful writer, but that was a long time ago. 
I thought maybe you could write here. Just don't! I don't want to hear it! God damn it, Alice! Alice was taken by a monster called the Dark Presence. I will tell you what to do. The Dark Presence made me write a horror story that came to life. No! It wore the face of an old woman. Behind the mask was pure darkness. The story would make it strong enough to escape the dark place. But there was a weapon to use against the dark presence. A light switch. The clicker. To save Alice, I needed to enter Cauldron Lake. Dive deeper. Back to work, boy. I resurfaced in the dark place. I fought the Dark Presence and took control of my story. I changed the ending. I sacrificed myself so Alice could go free. Now, I'm trapped in the dark place. Alan? This nightmare has only just begun. Next on Alan Wake. I need to escape before I lose my mind. I need to write a new story, a hero to help me. The dark presence is out there, hunting me. The killer left the heart next to the body. This wasn't some random act of violence. This was a ritual. A page of text written with a typewriter. Someone's been watching us. How do you run from an idea? From a story that lives in your head? I need to escape this nightmare. Wake says a story will change reality around us. Why are we written into this story? I brought you the heart witch. <laughs> 